Hello again, everybody. In case you're wondering what that piece of music was, it was another of the um, it was another of the pieces of music that Barbara chose when she appeared on uh, Desert Island Discs on BBC Radio in 1978, and it was the uh, Chardash from uh, Deflated Mass by Johann Strauss. Um, interesting that she chose music from two uh, very different Strausses, uh, Richard Strauss and uh, Johann Strauss. Now it's Deb here again, I'm the, in case you don't know or you weren't here earlier, I'm the chair of the Barbara Pym Society and I'd like to welcome you all from around the globe to this mini conference. Now we've never attempted anything like this before so uh, the live content will be will be fairly limited, but you can use the chat box at any time to give us feedback and we'll do our best to respond. Uh, I'll just reiterate that we're using Zoom as the platform for this event. Uh, we're also live streaming to YouTube. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, there's a 30 second delay, but you can still communicate via the chat box or you should be able to. Um, but if you find at any point that your internet connection is letting you down and uh, things don't look as good as they as you think they ought to, well, don't worry too much because you'll have an opportunity to see this content again at a later date. And the experience is quite new to all of us, so we're, we're still learning. Some of the content is live, some is recorded, and we found while rehearsing that some of the video content can be, you know, there can be a synchronization problem, which I think you've already noticed perhaps. But these little videos will all be preserved in the PIN Society archive so that they can be shown again at a later date, maybe even you know, at a future conference. And I mentioned earlier that I'm speaking to you from my daughter's house in London and Alex is very kindly hosting this for us because she's had more practice with Zoom and knows what she's doing. Alex, would you like to say hello again? Hello again, everybody. Uh, lovely to be here. As we said, there, there will be a bit of a delay. I'm, I'm trying to man all of the slides and the YouTube and the Zoom, so please bear with me. Um, this is this is my first broadcast, um, but looking forward to uh, messing it up in front of you all. I do, <laughs> do apologise in advance. Thank you. Now, unlike most conferences, this one doesn't consist entirely talks, although there are some talks and interviews to come. Uh, we're going to start with something from St Hilda's College and uh, in a moment we're going to go over to Bronwyn Travers who's uh, going to tell us a bit more about um, the new buildings. Of course St Hilda's is of course where we would have been today if it hadn't been for Covid and I expect a lot of you are still feeling a bit disorientated like I am so I'm hoping this will give you a bit of a lift and get us off to a good start. So uh, Bronwyn, come in. Bronwyn. Hi, Deb. Are you able to hear me? Yes, indeed. Lovely. May I start by sending the apologies from our Barbara Pym Fellow, and uh, that's uh, Professor Susan Jones, uh, also an alumna of St Hilda's. And she's asked me to read out a statement from her. Unfortunately, she had a clash with another conference and couldn't be here tonight, but she has written something and I'd like to share it. So. I'll, I'll read this out. I am sorry I cannot be with you for the first online conference for the Barbara Pym Society. As a college, we are grateful for the work of the society and its members. It is heartening to see that the seed that was sown through an alumni event at Pym's old college so many years ago has flourished and led to the creation of vibrant societies on both sides of the Atlantic. As the Barbara Pym Fellow, I am glad to see how your conferences and meetings continue to bring fresh perspectives to and appreciation of the work of one of St Hilda's most distinguished novelists. Her work draws on her time at Oxford in so many ways and rewards the close reading and careful examination that your gatherings provide. I find it moving that you are able to share your appreciation of her work back in the same buildings where Barbara Pym would have had her tutorials and that by your efforts on both sides of the Atlantic, new readers are drawn to her work. I would like to add thanks on behalf of the English School to your generous response to the Barbara Pym Room Appeal. 
and hope that when circumstances improve, the next Barbara Pym conference in the UK um, is very, very warmly welcome to make full use of these lovely new rooms, which you saw for those who were able to join earlier and uh, saw the film of the building work as it nears completion. Uh, Bronwyn, are you going to share oh, your slides with us now? Uh, yes, I am. Sorry, I'm just looking for the share slide function here. Oh, okay. Yes, the I... green button at the bottom of the screen. Yes, I've just got my... Hang on, I'll just exit from this. Right. Sorry about that. Yes, here we go. I'll just put up my screen and start it. Um, I think you need to let me do it. Here we go. It should come through now. It, uh, Deb, it keeps saying that host has disabled attendee screen sharing. So I think you might need to allow me to share oh, the sorry. screen. Uh, it's still not letting me do it. Uh, Bronwyn, um, yeah. Bronwyn um, yeah. Alex is going to bring up the slides at this end. Oh, is she? Sure. For you, seeing as uh, we okay. Okay. It's, quite figured um, out how to do it. If you, and it just says when I try to do it, it says host disabled attendee screen sharing. So maybe you need to, if you allow me. Yeah. Oh, here we go. Uh, we can probably figure out what's wrong, but we can see your slides now. Okay, great. Thanks. Well, I'm sure everyone has received a copy of the lovely brochure that Triona kindly um, created for the Barbara Pym Room Appeal. Um, full of images of Barbara Pym. This is one of my favorites. Um, you can see her striding along confidently and stylishly with her friends um, as she begins her Oxford years. And as we know, they were uh, extraordinarily important to her in her, in her time, uh, in, as, in her development as, as a writer. And here she is, um, naming a room in, uh, sorry, naming a room in memory of Barbara Pym. Here she is writing away and her love of Oxford, um, it comes through abundantly in her work um, and also in her experience, which is reflected through in her stories. I remember myself, the first uh, Pym novel I read was Jane and Prudence and I was struck by how beautifully observed uh, she had, uh, she was able to create the reunion of old students. I'm going to just show you a, an image of it now. Um, looking, walking beside the river, Jane and Prudence bring to life very much the feeling that many of you will have had when you've visited for the conferences. So her work was not only shaped by her experience of being at Oxford, but the uh, fine observation both while in college and afterwards. Now getting on to the money, um, we're very grateful indeed that so far we've received 6,240 pounds sterling for gifts to the appeal. Um, the gifts have come from both sides of the Atlantic and uh, we've had uh, 23 people altogether make a gift through the um, North American Society and uh, 13 in the UK. The largest single contribution has come from the PIM Society itself with its matching gift and we'd like to thank you very much for that. There is a gap and we hope it can be closed by the end of the summer 
uh, sorry, the end of the spring next year, because we want to formally open the buildings in May um, 2021. Again, circumstances permitting. And the gap is 3,760 pounds. So we hope that the Bowdoin coat will appeal to many and we will also continue to fundraise and remind those uh, who are not have not yet made a gift. If they did, it would help us greatly to be able to close the gap in time. Uh, you'll notice the arrow on the screen points to the Barbara Pym room. It will be it will have a garden in front of it, but it's very nicely situated to be rather a social room in college, which I think perhaps re reflects something of Pym's own experience of her time at Oxford. Let me show you, um, oh, and you'll see this building I should explain is the large building you will have seen in the film. Uh, it's on the boundary of the college and it will contain 52 student rooms. Um, they are all en suite. They will provide fantastic accommodation for your next visit to St Hilda's, I hope. And um, for those who still want the authentic student experience, we can still provide that with some of the other uh, rooms in other buildings, which I'm sure you've grown to, to love in, in that special way. But these will be superb rooms and they will look out onto the river. Um, not all of them, but Pim's room will. And they will also be beautifully fitted out. So I hope that that will encourage many to uh, make the trip across the Atlantic to have a, an amazing experience in these new buildings. On the top of the buildings, you may have seen, there'll be large terraces and you can just see in this image here, there's a, a, a brown um, top story to the building. That will be conference space. So the conference space will have these amazing views across to the dreaming spires. Down below, the two characters uh, walking through in this ar uh, architect's impression, um, there is the pavilion on the right hand side. And that again will be an amazing space um, for a gathering of around 100 or more people can um, be accommodated in that space. So again, lots of new ways to come back and enjoy the uh, time in Oxford and to host some of the wonderful conferences that you bring to the college regularly. Coming down to the room itself, um, here's an example of one of the rooms. We haven't shown you the bathroom. You're going to have to take our word for it that it's uh, very nicely fitted out. But it will have, um, in this case, a view across to the gardens and across to Oxford. And there'll be quite, um, quite large rooms by student room standards. I think um, here, uh, Barbara Pym describes her room, the, the chaste green cover for my bed, check cushions, beautiful pictures. Well, this is a, just a showroom at the moment. Books and bookends, bronze, golden chrysanthemums on the table in the window alcove. I hear Maudlin and Merton clocks all the time. And that will certainly be the experience for the people staying in these lovely new rooms. Um, as I mentioned, we have a gap of 3,760 and we hope that there'll be a, a final response to the appeal so that we're able to conclude that before the formal openings of the buildings, which will occur in May of next year. Of course, the students will take up residence this coming term, but we won't have the formal opening until things um, uh, allow for that next year. And all the details are here. I'm sure we will mail you out uh, another brochure and a reminder for that. The Barbara Pym room is one of 52 new ensuite student rooms. And uh, with the pandemic and all the focus on accommodating our students, it's now more important than ever to be able to give students their own room, a comfortable room, and 
to ensure they have all the facilities at their disposal in college. And these will be amongst the best new rooms um, anywhere in Oxford. In the vacation, they'll be used by conference guests so that they will benefit the college's finances over time. Um, it will mean a lot to every student who lives in the Barbara Pym room, not just that they will have a chance to learn more about one of our most distinguished St Hilda's novelists and to understand um, the enormous support that has been gathered through the work of many alumni on the committee and many friends and fans of Barbara Pym. But they will also be saved um, more than about £1,500 a year in terms of the cost of accommodation. Colleges hold rents as low as possible for the students and uh, I'm afraid the Oxford landlords um, are um, rather less forgiving in their charges. So this will be like a bursary to a student, to every student who lives in that room. So not only are you doing a wonderful thing to help us to bring Barbara Pym's name into the fabric of the college, but you'll be supporting each student who lives in that room um, from the opening, which will be in October when the students move in. And last but not least, um, it is one room in a much larger campaign. So everyone who has contributed to the Barbara Pym Room Appeal has made a gift that adds to the um, darker green amount on this pie chart. We are at, this was as at April 2020. So in fact, the, um, the total is uh, I think just over 10 million. And we have around 8 million pledged um, donations to come in. So our initial total for our building work was 15 million. We've now got pledges that we think that will take us through to 18 million. But we have new costs for the second phase of our building program. So I expect that we will be um, moving forward with that once we know a little bit more about circumstances and how we'll be able to do that after the pandemic. So happy to take any questions um, or um, or comments on, on what we're doing. It's okay, Barack, when I am um, asked everyone to meet the staff because we don't want to be, um, you know, uh, what's the word? It might get a bit um, unmanageable. So um, instead, if anybody's got any questions, they can put them into the uh, chat box and uh, we'll deal with them later. Uh, uh, so thank you ever so much, Barack, as you can imagine. So um, uh, we'll go back to our um, regular screens now. Uh, Alex will share her screen again. Um, so I'll just reiterate that the Boat and Coat competition is an important part of our fundraising effort. And now I, I, I think that um, uh, I mentioned this previously. Um, uh, the one we've got, uh, they, it was Yuta's idea, Yuta Schiller's idea, to ask Bowden when we found out they had a pin code to ask them if they would donate one for it, which they did. But of course, we had to take what, you know, we had to order it in advance. We could only have one. So we ordered a fairly medium size, size 14, and uh, the camel, it's the color is camel. And uh, as I said earlier, those of you who are thinking, well, um, that's not my size and I'd have preferred another colour. Well, I hope you'll just think about the fact that if you should win it, you could give it as a present to a friend or relation uh, who I know will appreciate it. Um, so we're asking members to enter a draw by donating £5 to the fund and that can be done through the website. Um, and we will send those links out again uh, later as well. Now, Further to this, uh, Barbara Pym was not the only famous novelist to come out of St Hilda's. And um, we've got now a message from uh, someone else who's um, 
kindly sent us her good wishes. I'm Kate Fenton, St Hilda's old girl and novelist, and very happy to greet fellow Barbara Pym enthusiasts wherever in the world you're locked down. No two ways about it, conferences aren't quite as much fun on Zoom, are they? And not just because you have to supply your own tea and biscuits. Hello, I'm Kate Fenton, St Hilda's old girl and novelist, and very happy to greet fellow Barbara Pym enthusiasts wherever in the world you're locked. I can't go on. Sorry, we're just having a, uh, a another technical problem with the sound here. We'll be uh, we'll sending, we'll be putting it on again in a moment. <laughs> Herself might have observed. I found myself thinking about her, in fact, early on in the Covid blight of days. On Easter Sunday, when we retreated to the Archbishop of Canterbury, leading the nation's worship from his kitchen workshop, I rather longed to know what she would make of it, the ginger pine dresser. I'm sorry. Um, could uh, any could any people confirm whether they can hear the film of Kate, or uh, or anybody who can't hear it just mention it? It's not coming through uh, it's, at it's our intermittent. end. It's intermittent. It starts and then it just freezes. Still, I dare say she will be trudging staunchly through these strange times, aren't we all? But hooray for you, creating a room at St Hilda's in celebration of her. I was rereading Jane and Prudence recently, the college to which they return at the beginning of the book for a reunion with its view of river and tower, can only be St Hilda's, her college, our college. So how wonderful that she'll have a room in the splendid new building to which she herself can return in spirit. I wish you all very well. I'm really grateful to Kate for doing that for us. I'm a big fan of her novels and there's been uh, a long gap since her last, so I'm really looking forward to her new one, which is called The Time of Her Life and it's out in paperback this month. Um, some of you may have read some of the earlier ones. If not, I, I really recommend them. Now the next, um, some of you saw the, I know, saw the title pin friends say hello and until um this morning i wasn't 100 percent sure what that would consist of um now one of the great things about the conference we have in oxford is the opportunity to see friends and catch up with what they've been doing recently lockdown has made this more difficult if many faces on hand to greet you and i hope this will uh, make you uh, feel um, personally involved in today's event. Um, now, to begin with, um, sorry, we've got the long wait up at the moment. Um, can you unmute Lorraine? Okay. Uh, uh, Lorraine, uh, one of those uh, people, Lorraine Mapham has been one of those people who've been getting together by Zoom during lockdown. Um, I hope to go over to Lorraine in Salisbury. Now are you there, Lorraine? I am. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, loud and clear. Excellent. Uh, would, you like to, would you like to tell us about what you've been doing? OK, thanks very much, Deb. Well, uh, as Deb said, um, some of us have been meeting uh, via Zoom uh, so I'd like to tell you a little bit about our group, which consists of six of us, as well as myself and, and Deb herself as well. We have Ruth Taylor in Northern Ireland. We have Libby Tempest in Yorkshire. 
Maggie Parsons, who's our UK secretary in the Midlands, um, and Ros Cleal, who lives near me in Wiltshire. And we've been meeting weekly for four months, um, hosted by Ruth, uh, except on the occasions when she forgets. Um, initially, this was supposed to be a group contribution. Um, you know, we were, we were going to film a snippet of our Zoom meeting um, in which we saw ourselves elegantly dressed, uh, each clutching a small glowing drink. Uh, we'd be chatting informati informatively about world literature and possibly bringing you an uplifting message from the UK about how we are all carrying on being splendid during lockdown. However, due to a combination of technological incompetence, illness, uh, and the disappearance of one of our members to the cyber void of Norfolk, uh, this hasn't happened. So I'm afraid you're left with me, uh, last woman standing. So what have we been talking about over the last four months? Well, books, obviously, books, lots of them. We've been exchanging our favourite bits of PIM and other lockdown recommendations. Ros has been reading about the Bronze Age. Libby has been flying the flag for Mrs Gaskell. Had you realised, for example, that Cranford is really a story about excellent women? And I've been binge reading Marjorie Allingham. But that's not all. It's really been marvellously sustaining and often hilarious. We've heard about Ruth's tribulations as a teacher during the insanity of the UK's return to school. We've sympathised with Maggie when she recently broke her wrist uh, and with Libby, who is dealing with family illness and has to drive up and down the country. Um, but we've also heard about Ruth's obsession with the British actor Roger Allen, and we've rejoiced in the recent repeats of Cabin Pressure on Radio 4. We've cried with laughter over Ross's amazing spider stories, and we've discussed whether it would be sensible to Libby, for Libby to wear big knickers on a date. <laughs> and I hope we've offered some light relief for Deb during the stresses of organising this conference. I'll leave you with my current favourite PIM quote, and this is from Civil to Strangers, when Adam Marsh Gibbon visits Oxford, and of course he meets a clergyman who is writing a thesis on the subject of all those who died in the Bodleian. We may be taken at any time, he says. So I'll raise a glass to my fellow Zoomers, and this is definitely not the cup that cheers but not inebriates, Thank you for my weekly highlights of literature and laughter, and I'll see you all next week. Although, of course, only if we're spared. Cheers. Thank you so much for that, Lorraine. Um, yes, and you're quite right. You all have cheered me up a lot during uh, during um, the, the stress recent stresses. Um, and another thing that I could mention to Lorraine, actually, uh, the mention of Marjorie Allingham reminded me that this one year then I uh, passed a, a house near Paddington where Marjorie Allingham had lived with a blue plaque on it. Now, uh, Jutta is one of those people who hasn't allowed the pandemic to get her down. Um, she wasn't able to cancel the flight she'd booked to get her from Germany to the UK for the conference. So she decided to make the most of it. And I, I hope she's watching this from her hotel in Paddington now. Well, Jutta and I uh, had an outing today and a little bit of an adventure. And um, I have now a little bit of uh, film uh, that, again, it won't be good because I took it. But um, uh, uh, Jutta's going to tell you about what we've been doing this morning. Father Henry this morning, we saw that around the church that I mean, he was quite really nice man. I mean, he could have been just out of the novel of Barbara Tim, uh, although he was married. We saw his, we met his wife this morning. But he told us quite a lot about this church and he showed us this marvelous interior. I mean, there was even a wall down there and he told us about storm scenes that have been taken in the church. I mean, he told us about the connections Peter James had with this church, with this church, and even 
Smith and Freud uh, both living nearby. I think Father Henry will read more of our, at least he might read more books, uh, more novels of Father King. He has read quite a lot, a couple of them, and he says he can't remember them, but he remembers his titles, so they must have been spent. So, but that was really nice of him to show us around. There we are. Now, um, in case you missed any of that, I weren't quite sure what we were uh, doing um, and where we were. We were at the Church of St. Mary Magdalene, Paddington. And uh, the, what gave us the idea to go there was re reading this little section from uh, a letter that uh, Barbara wrote to, to Bob Smith, in fact, who, who someone was talking about on the chat earlier on the 31st of October 1971, when she was living at 40 Brooksville Avenue and her church, her regular church, St. Lawrence's, had closed and she was having to find an alternative place of worship. And what she, one of the things she wrote in this letter was as follows. Um, the event for us has been the closing of St. Lawrence's. It closed at the end of September without ceremony. But last Wednesday, the Bishop of Wilston came and gave us a sung mass, and quite a lot of people came. Since the closing, we've been to St. Mary Magdalene's Paddington. It has rather good music and quite an amusing vicar, dragging on a cigarette and curate, who live in a startlingly modern clergy house just opposite the church. Now, when Yutra and I went there this morning, uh, we uh, learned from the vicar, Father Henry, that um, the, uh, well, in fact, he still lives in this startlingly modern house. But don't get the idea that it's some kind of architectural masterpiece, because it's quite the opposite of that. And it was built in 1969. So when Barbara went there, it, it was only um, two years old. Um, he assured us that they still had very good music at the church. And he was also able to tell us the name of the smoking vicar, who was a father, Stevenson, who'd, uh, who was there for many years. And um, he also told us, I'm not sure if I'm revealing too many trade secrets here, but Yuta mentioned the connection with P.D. James. And P.D. James wrote a book called A Taste for Murder, which is set in a church next to the Grand Union Canal. And that, church next to the Grand Union Canal is of course St Mary Magdalene except that P.D. James denied any knowledge of this church or any connection with it but Father Henry told us that um, one of the characters in the book is a um, very very closely resembles Father Stevenson um, who was the vicar at the time when she wrote it. So we think that she denied the similarity purely for uh, reasons of, of wanting not to get sued. So that's a little extra story for you. Now, finally, uh, in this section, just emphasize that this is an international society. Uh, again, we've got a, a film contribution. So it's over to Dan and Anne Di Pietro in the United States. Hi everyone, I thought we'd give you a little rundown of what Dan and I have been doing since uh, the beginning of March. The very first day when we all were supposed to stay in our homes, um, uh, I'm the director of a small library here in Seacliff. Uh, it's just for children and uh, we do story hours you know, throughout the year. So we decided that that day, that very first day, we would uh, do a story 
uh, virtually. Dan uh, filmed it and we had little songs and so forth. Uh, and I told everyone at that time that we would be together for a few weeks and then we'd be back together uh, at the library. Well, uh, Dan told me that uh, when we were uh, filming today's uh, story time, I think we've hit up to 170 stories. Also, we have a, an organization here in Seacliff, it's called the Civic Association, and we run all sorts of great events, especially in the summer. We have concerts, we have strolls, we have uh, uh, historical reenactments. Uh, so again, <laughs> we had to turn to, uh, turn to our virtual world, and um, Dan will tell you more about it because he was very, very involved in the um, videoing of it, but we did a James Joyce jaunt. Usually we walk through the village reenacting aspects of uh, Bloomsday, but this year it was um, virtual. And um, also all well, our concerts, we have these, we call them sunset uh, serenades and they're right down by the water. And uh, it's very, very, uh, very special. So we decided we'd do that you know, people would do it in their homes. Also, we're involved in a um, story time at the beach. It's a, a pretty, very pretty small beach. And there we limited the number of parents and children, but we did story time. And all of that, of course, is on YouTube and can be seen. But all of this is fine, but how great it will be next year when we're, when we're all together again. Hi dear friends in PIM. It's great to be seen by uh, all of you. I'm pleased to tell you that after uh, several discussions with uh, Deb, uh, we've agreed to produce a video play taking the dramatized reading that I did a few years ago of Crampton Hodnett and creating it into a COVID-friendly uh, video play where uh, the actors will record their parts in the comfort of their own homes and uh, through the magic of, uh, of iMovie, the app, I will splice that together. And I've got the benefit of uh, working with a good friend of mine who is a professional writer uh, slash producer slash director uh, who will guide me through that process. So be on the lookout for that. That will happen probably between the end of November and uh, Christmas. So we're looking forward to that. And we're looking forward to seeing everybody again as soon as it's possible. Oh, I'm sure you all enjoyed that. Um, I certainly did anyway, um, seeing those familiar faces again. Uh, now, um, members are always uh, inquiring after the um, health and well-being of Yvonne Cocking, our archivist, of course, turned 90 in March. And as I said in, during the AGM, I dropped in to see Yvonne yesterday on my way up to London and she was in fine fettle. Um, and a couple of weeks ago, Linda McDougall dropped in to see her and made a lovely little film for us. Um, and I hope that uh, you'll be able to enjoy it now. Well, I hardly need to tell you that tea is a recurring theme in all Barbara Pym's novels. Not only the innumerable cups, which any occasion seemed to require, but also the meal, which was an essential part of the middle class's routine, whether eaten in with a homemade cake or cakes from a bakery, at the houses of friends or in a tea shop. Barbara Pym's novels illustrate the almost ritual importance of this meal. Who will forget Miriam's rendition of Miss Doggett in Crampton Hobnet, shrilly interrupting her companion, who is getting ready for the Sunday afternoon tea party for carefully selected undergraduate guests? Miss Morrow, Miss Morrow, where are the buns from Boffins? In the same novel, when Edwin Killigrew and his mother were holding a tea party. She asked him, did you remember to bring the cakes from Boffins? Oh, mother, you know I did, he replied. In So Some Tempestuous Morn, 
another story featuring characters from Crampton Hodnett, though in different roles, Miss Doggett tells her niece Anthea, who is lacking some occupation, you might go along with Miss Morrow. I shall want some cakes from Boffins. I will go for the cakes, Aunt Maud, replied Anthea, but she dallied on her way in the company of an attractive young man. And it was only when she got to Boffins that she noticed that the best cakes were gone. So Boffins appeared to be the bakery of choice to supply the tea tables of North Oxford in the 1930s. It had a long history from the mid-19th to the mid-20th centuries. From 1852 to 1866, James Boffin Baker had premises advertising itself as cook, confectioner, bread and biscuit maker, first at 109 and then at 107 High Street. From 1875 to 1930, there was another Boffins at 71 St Giles. One would like to think that Miss Morrow bought her cakes here, as that would be the nearest shop to North Oxford. But it was demolished in 1931 to make way for an extension to the Taylorian institution, so Barbara would never have seen it. Number one, Queen Street had also been a boffin establishment since 1852. This, I think, was the only actual tea shop and probably on several floors. Margaret Cleveland remembered how her husband had once recited the whole of Marvels to his coy mistress to her over tea in boffins. But there is little else suggesting that Pym's characters patronized it as they did the, the baker's shops. <clears throat> A photograph taken in 1932 shows the building with the name Boffins writ large along an upper story. This is now part of Santander Bank. I'm not sure exactly when Queen Street closed, probably sometime between 1932 and 1941, as Agatha says in So Very Secret, written at the latter date. I had just said to Frieda that I could do with a nice cup of tea, and she says, Boffins isn't there anymore, so we had to go to Lyons. Finally, I'd like to return to Boffins, the only one of these companies which traded exclusively in Oxford. This is how Barbara's friend Robert Liddell, who was an expert rhymer, especially of epitaphs, ended his verses on the death and funeral of a Don who had apparently killed himself because of an unrequited love. Wheeler had made the coffin, Mowbray had lent the pall, Refreshments were by Boffin. Such was the funeral. Right, I, uh, I hope everybody can hear me because um, I, uh, I keep losing my Zoom connection. Um, so uh, I I'm quite sure when things have finished, but um, I think you'll have all enjoyed that that little film. I know I did, um, and I thought it was a work of art, really, by Linda. And I think we also have to thank Linda's son, who who did some of the fancy stuff, adding the music and so on. So, thank you again, Linda. And we, we'll be speaking to Linda in a few minutes, briefly. Uh, before that, um, have we got anything in the chat box, Alex? That needs to be. Uh, answered at the moment um but mostly just people complaining they can't hear the videos and i'm really sorry about that um it's obviously because i'm hosting it's coming through really clearly in my headphones but i'm trying to make sure that mm. i've got uh, all of the, yeah. the volume right mm. um but just to let you know so this the this video youtube channel is now is now yours it's uh it belongs to the pin society so what we can do is we can upload these videos uh, to the YouTube for you to peruse at a later date without skipping and with proper audio. So uh, again, I can only apologise for ruining your conference, everyone. This is what happens when my mum lets me tag along. <laughs> Very sorry, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, as Alex said, we we realised earlier today that what we're going to have to do is to download these the short films, um, the 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 bronze film and um, the films of your turn. Um, uh, we're going to have to um, download them directly to YouTube in order to give you proper, um, uh, enable you to view them at their best. 
And, um, and next we've got our next uh, section, if you like, uh, it's in a recording. It's um, a recording from one of the society's uh, greatest supporters. And some of you have seen these extracts before at PIM conferences, but even if you have, I know you'll enjoy seeing and hearing them again. Um, so uh, without further ado. Jessie Morrow was a thin, used out looking woman in her middle 30s. She had been Miss Doggett's companion for five years and knew that she was better off than many of her kind because she had a very comfortable home and one did at least meet interesting people in Oxford. Undergraduates came every week to Miss Doggett's Sunday afternoon tea parties and her nephew Francis Cleveland, who lived only a few houses away, was a fellow of Randolph College and a university lecturer in English literature. Miss Morrow went upstairs to her large, cold bedroom and put on her dark green Moroccan dress. The mirror was in an unflattering light. She saw only too clearly her thin neck and small, undistinguished features, her faded blonde hair done in a severe knot. There was no time to put powder or a touch of colour on her cheeks, for Miss Doggett was already calling her. Miss Morrow? Miss Morrow? She called, her voice rising to a shrill note. Where are the buns from Boffins? Florence says she can't find them. You ought to see to these things. Where did you put them? In the sideboard in a tin, shouted Miss Morrow, struggling with the hooks of her dress. Which tin? The Balmoral one. What? I can't hear you. Why don't you come down? Miss Morrow rushed out of her room, looking rather dishevelled. I mean the tin with the picture of Balmoral on it, she explained. Oh, here they are, madam, said Florence. I'm sorry I didn't look in here. Well, hurry up. The young men will be arriving soon. That is always oh, very enjoyable. Now, um, we're going to have a quick word with Linda McDougall. Can we unmute Linda, please? Welcome, Linda. Unmute yourself. Mm -hmm. Linda has. Linda. Hi, Linda. You've got something to tell us about Miriam, haven't you? No, I have. Well, lots of awful things have happened to me today, but the worst of all was uh, I had a, a great and wonderful surprise for you in that Miriam, who's in Italy, was going to say a few words because Miriam is one of the staunchest, most wonderful supporters of the Thin Society. She turns up at loads of conferences. She she couldn't do more for us as she tried. She she filmed lots of things for various PIM, I wouldn't distinguish them by the title of films, but PIM efforts that uh, that I've done since uh, 2012 when we were getting ready for the PIM centenary. Anyway, she, Miriam, after weeks, nay, months of being incredibly glamorous on every British television programme, and if you haven't seen her, her stories of Australia, they're fantastic. If you haven't heard some of the podcasts that she's been on, well, that's what I wanted to talk to her about tonight. What I was going to say, she had agreed that she's in Italy and she was going to appear and she was going to answer some questions from me. So you can imagine, I mean, forget what ben Deb says about how difficult Zoom is. I was thinking to myself, oh my God, I'm going to interview Miriam. Now, the main thing that I've read about Miriam in the last few days, it's all over the papers, and I'm sorry if it offends you, but she's been saying that she managed to have an orgasm at the age of three. Now, that really put me out because I didn't manage to have an orgasm until I was five. And so I was really keen to ask Miriam how she managed this. But about just about an hour before we went on air for the meeting, the the the, 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 the committee meeting, rather the uh, annual general meeting, rather than for this wonderful piece, she sent me a message saying, I'm terribly sorry and can you possibly forgive me and will all the pimpsters forgive me but 
I can't do it because they're making me go out to dinner. And I, of course I understood because she's on holiday with someone else in Italy. So I rushed upstairs then to get in touch with Deb and my trusty computer, which I think I got the House of Commons to buy for my husband, my really enormous Mac desktop, just stopped working at about 10 minutes before the thing began. And I sent Deb a, a sort of text from my phone saying, will you forgive me, this is what's happened. And then she said, no, it's too near the beginning now. So chaos reigned. So here you see me uh, looking utterly eccentric in our dining room with a statue, because I've had to sort of park my laptop on top of a few books. And if I turn you around that way, you'll see there's the ironing board. And there's the sheets, which I plan in a good pim like way to deal with after this is over. Anyway, what I, the one thing I wanted to say about Barbara is, I think of her so much now, because this is the most perfect time. Imagine if Barbara were here now. In fact, the world needs Barbara, because lockdown has become such a strange mess all over the United Kingdom. Nobody quite knows what to do. And it's a, it's a time when nothing actually happens. And I think Barbara would have excelled in a time like that because when I lived in Brooksville Avenue opposite where she lived, I knew years went by in Brooksville Avenue without anything ever happening. And Barbara would have loved that. But more than anything else, she would have absolutely adored contract tracing, which is what is supposed to go on under Baroness Dido Harding, I think the name of the lady is who runs it where people are to trace your contract, contacts, who you've been with, so that we can know who gave COVID-19 to who. This has been a disastrous failure. And all the time when I hear about yet another disastrous failure with contract tracing, I think if only Barbara was here, because she, she was a genius in getting, finding people, imagining where people were, wandering from church to church, looking for a stray vicar, she was wonderful. And so wherever you are now, Barbara, if only you could come back, you could save Britain from the ignominy of COVID-19. Thanks, Deb. Thank you so much, Linda. And, and... Yeah, thank you so much, Linda. I, I totally agree with you about all that. Um, uh, well, now we've, uh, we've arrived at the climax of our mini conference. I say climax, I don't know how it's going to uh, show up. Sorry, Linda, did you say something? Well, no. I was talking about Miriam's orgasm, actually, so that's all right. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> right, okay. So as I mentioned during the gym, uh, Barbara Pym will be having a new biography next year written by Paula Byrne. Now, Paula, who is now living in the United States, recently recorded a Zoom interview with Kathy Ackley, hosted by Linda McDougall. Again, because she is our go-to person for anything creative, Linda is. I only discovered the other night when I was looking through it, when I saw it for the first time, that she will occasionally see a strange face popping up between uh, between them, um, I did sit in on part of the interview and I didn't realise I wasn't muted during the recording. So every time I made an approving noise in response to something Paula or Kathy said, my face came up on the screen. So if you see me popping up there, just ignore me and enjoy this uh, interview. I'm Linda McDougall and I've been a member of the PIM Society for 10 years. I'm at home in Yorkshire, just a short walk across the moors from where the Bronte sisters used to live and work and write their books. It's my very pleasant task to introduce Paula Byrne, a Liverpudlian who's now living in Arizona and the best-selling author of biographies of Jane Austen, Evelyn Waugh and Perdita Robinson. Her new life of Barbara Pym will be published next year. Paul is going to be interviewed by Kathy Ackley, founder member of the Pym Society and Emeritus Professor of English at the University of Wisconsin. Wouldn't Barbara be amazed 
how COVID-19 and quarantine in autumn has brought us all together. We're a truly international organization now. Over to you, Kathy. Okay. Well, hello, Paula. It's delightful to meet you. Um, I'd like to start by asking what it was that attracted you to Barbara Pym as a subject for a biography. What about her especially appeals to you? Well, hello, everyone, and thank you for having me. Um, it's great to be here. Um, Kathy, um, really good question. Do you know, I, to be honest, I came to Barbara Pym relatively late in life. Um, I was living in Oxford where my husband was the head of an Oxford college and there was this fantastic independent bookshop around the corner and it was run by a very grumpy man called Dennis, I'm sure he won't mind me saying that, who was an absolute Pym addict and so he had all of her novels, those gorgeous, vintage, beautifully bright um, novels on his bookshelf and he was always giving recommendations to students and to to, to uh, academics and and he recommended um, excellent women and I, I said oh, I've never really heard of Barbara Pym and of course Dennis was horrified and then sort of I think about five people in the bookshop said you've never heard of Barbara Pym <laughs> you know, and, and then I realized that there was a whole sort of <laughs> cabal of Pymites um, of male Oxford academic Pymites who happened to be in the bookshop who were sort of horrified and I thought well I, what have I missed and so I started reading her and I obviously fell in love. I mean, I, I write about Jane Austen. So she's right up my street, basically, so domestic comedies and, um, you know, those, those sort of wonderful uh, settings. So it, I came late. Um, I loved her. I realized that she was a girl very close uh, geographically from where I grew up. And some of the same places we used to go to Catheli in Wales, where Pim went, Bob Riven went. Um, and she'd had sort of similar, similar experiences coming to Oxford, like I did. And so I felt a sort of kinship with her. I felt um, that her books were fantastic and they deserved to be brought to a wider audience. So that's really where I began thinking, why don't more people know about this fantastic writer? Um, and that was the premise with which I began. Well, yeah. Excellent. It's always exciting, I think, to have a new book on a favorite author. And I'm especially intrigued by the title you've selected, The Adventures of Miss Barbara Pym. So I'd like you to talk for a little bit about the book and especially how you came to that title. Um, what's your approach then? What readers can expect? Um, and whether you came across any new material in your research? So a multi-pronged question. Multi-pronged. Um, so the title changed. It was it was going to be called Excellent Women, um, and with a with a um, the semicolon and then a, a new life of Barbara Pym. Um, and to be absolutely frank, when I began the research in the Bodleian, I I began thinking it was a rather dull life, and I and I was worried about this. I thought it's a really dull life. Nothing really much happened. But what is so fantastic are the novels. And that completely changed in the course of the research. And I, I guess Pym herself would say there is no such thing as a conventional dull life, um, because I don't think there is. Everybody's lives are interesting. Um, and I was thinking, I was reading Tom Jones at the time and knowing that Barbara Pym loved 18th century novels. And I love those novels, The Adventures of, you know, in which our heroine goes off to Petheli for her holiday. Um, and I had this idea of, of, I was thinking about her as a sort of 18th century heroine. And then of course, in the front of her diary, she calls it the adventures of Miss Barbara Pym. So it's really, it, it's her own words, but also um, an allusion to the fact that she was a great reader. And then I found this lovely, lovely letter when she says, I see myself as an 18th century heroine. And it all clicked. It all sort of clicked together for me. And I thought, oh, this is fantastic because this is how I see her. Um, I also wanted quite short chapters. It's a very long book, um, much, much longer. I mean, I contracted for uh, 300 pages. It's 600 pages. It's, it's oh a my. big, fat book. Um, and I, I was really worried about this. So I think having the sort of small, the sort of rather short chapters um, in this sort of picaresque, adventure way sort of resonated and it, and it, it seemed to, to, to fit well. So that's where I came to the adventures of Miss Barbara Pym and, and also the way that she, you know, she did, she liked her friends calling her Miss Pym. 
and as they did from Oxford when she was tutors Pym at Oxford, her tutors would call her Pym and she liked being Miss Pym so I wanted to pay that respect. Um, so it, it turned, it transpired it, to be a rather different book than what I had set out to do or what I thought about what, what I thought was a conventional life and far from it really. Okay, thank you. Um, so then did you come across any new material or was that the <clears throat> the uh, the picaresque kind of approach that uh, uh you know sort of sprang out at you well i did come across a lot of new material okay. and, and um i think this is where i do think um the digital world has really transformed the writing of biographies and I'll explain what I mean by that. And it's obviously the archive in the Bodleian is, is vast, it's huge. Yeah. And I mean, I am standing on the shoulders of giants here. I mean, you know, the work that's been done before by, by Hazel Holt and, yeah. and Hillary, but I think, and Yvonne, who I think is a fantastic yeah. scholar of Pym. I mean, she's so thorough. Yeah. It, it, she's really, I met Yvonne and I love her. She's fantastic. Um, However, I, what I was able to do in the, in the Bodling, because it was so huge, it, would, it probably would have taken me sort of five years if I'd just been sitting in the Bodling. But they allowed me to take photographs of everything on my phone, which I did when I wrote the Kit Kennedy biography, which again was a massive archive. Mm -hmm. And the beauty of, and they prefer, librarians prefer this now because it means you're not damaging, you're not, whole, you're not touching them, manuscripts, you're not damaging them. So they were, pretty happy so I photographed everything and then I put that onto Google Docs and what it meant was in the leisure of my own home I was just able to zoom in so if, you know, it's, it's very hard it's pressured working in a, in a manuscript library you know you it's cold um, but you know you, you you have to you miss things and I say this as a, as a scholar myself that you miss things um, or you you may not really understand a particular word it is fantastic. I can zoom in on every word and every um, every piece of punctuation, and it's transformative. So I'm a beneficiary, I think, of these new digital um, resources. And I did find there was a lot that had been edited out. There's a lot that's been omitted, and I think probably because that was out of respect to people who were still alive when. The biography came out um, and when the edition of the letters came out many many people were still alive and it's completely understandable that those um, excisions and omissions were made um, but it was quite interesting going back and say seeing oh there's two pages missing there and then when you look at the edition the letters the edition of the letters there's not even an ellipsis so um it was fascinating to me and there were met there are many new things obviously i don't want to say too much because i, I don't want to spoil the surprise um but there, there will definitely be some surprises uh, excellent so uh, the last thing i'd like to ask you paula is uh, what you see as the future of barbara pym and her novels i think the future is very bright for barbara pym um, I think sh more and more people will read her. It's such a consistently good body of work. The novels still feel, t to me, very fresh um, and very funny. Um, and I want my great hope with the new biography is to bring that new generation of authors back to her. That's why I write biographies. It's, 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 it's about getting people to say, oh, that's somebody I don't know. Would I like her books? The ultimate gain for me, and the ultimate goal for me, is that more people read Barbara Pym. I think she deserves to be read, and I, I think she is such an amazing writer. I think that she's a writer for whom there is such development in the novels. You know, the, the first, from the sort of first, say six, seven, to the later novels, and then this is a woman who develops over the years brilliantly. Um, and it's so, to me, still so shocking. My editor said, damn, Tom Mashler. She was really annoyed about Tom. How dare he, you know, how dare he? Because you, I, mean, I think one of the most painful things for me as a biographer, and I feel this way about Jane Austen too, is um, those years when she should have been 
oh, published yeah. and then we would have had more pain because she would have kept writing and in the same way Jane Austen if she'd been published in 1803 which is when she should have been published not 1811 mm -hmm. we'd have had another can you imagine another six novels by Jane Austen mm -hmm. and I sort of feel it's really sad but on the other hand we do have these marvelous Pym, Pym novels but I, I, I really feel strongly that this is her time going back to your question Kathy this mm -hmm. feels like Pym's time and I think in COVID times people do turn to certain writers for comfort and for solace and I think that's really important and and for humor you know she is so funny but she's so why the wisdom is there too so I think I really feel like this is Pym's time I feel like that the people are ready and ripe um, for this kind of, 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 of novel. Um, so that was the great hope. And I do, I, as I say, I do think the future is really bright. No, I, I, I totally agree with you, actually. So. The one thing I didn't get to ask you was when it's going to be published. So we might want to find that out and then mention it. Um, so it's April 2021. So um, it, it will be quite soon. It's going into copy. It's copy editing in August. So all, right. all being well, it should be out in April. Okay. So you're, thank you for having me and thank you for your support. Uh, well, I think you might get quite a lot of at least 400 people. That would be a good start. Right? Yeah. I think so too. <laughs> definitely, definitely. I'm excited. I'm really excited for it. So. <laughs> thank you, Paula. That was really, thank you all. Yeah, it was wonderful. There we are. Um, some of you may be thinking uh, the same thing that I was thinking when we finished filming that, which was that um, I wished it could have gone on for much longer. So uh, you'll be pleased to hear that, that we intend to record a full length interview with Paula at a later date, closer to the release of the book, and to make that available to our members as well. And I believe St Hilda's also have plans to arrange an event with Paula in the spring if possible, um, because currently it is the plan for her to be in the UK at that time. And that's not the only thing we will have in store for you in the next a uh, few months. As you heard earlier, Dan Di Pietro has been working hard on the script for a lockdown reading of Crampton Hobnet, which we hope to release to you in the run up to Christmas. Uh, the current plan is for all this online content to be free to members. And of course, Jutta Schiller is already working on the next issue of Green Leaves, so there's plenty for members to look forward to. Now, at the end of a normal PIM conference, I usually feel a little bit down. Um, I remember having a conversation about this subject with the great Ellen Miller, and um, she told me how some of the US members said the same thing. So perhaps it's a silver lining in the COVID cloud. Having an online conference instead of a live one does have two advantages. One is that uh, we'll be putting it on YouTube so you can watch it all again whenever you feel like it. And the other one is that you don't have to travel home afterwards. So, you know, something to, uh, something to be a, a little bit upbeat about there. And for those of you on Zoom, Alex is going to unmute everyone so that we can all see it, say our farewells at the same time. Oh, dear, dear. Oh, no. I think. If you're able to unmute yourself, go for it. And if you're able to unmute yourself, <laughs> please go for it. I would Tom Sopko. Tom Sopko. Yeah, we're all we're all here, Rita. Yeah. Yeah. Very Wow. The cacophony. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you to everybody.